right, check one, two. Just checking to see if you can hear me okay and see me okay. Uh, I actually did go live last Monday, but of course, if you were on Facebook, there was the whole Facebook debacle. So I uh, tried to go live, but it didn't work. If you were on YouTube, of course, we were chatting. But uh, anyway, just let me know. Say hello. Let me know where you're from. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with this week's Monday Guitar Motivation. Hey, Ronald, how you doing? KS is here. Very nice. Kush is here. Russ is here. Mike Rudolph is here. How you doing, Mike? Uh, Tim is here. Very nice. Uh, let's see here. Tom says, Norway calling. Very nice. <laughs> uh, Jay Murph is here from Illinois. How you doing, bud? Stein time. Yes, it is. Uh, Ryan is here. Louie is here. How you doing? From Puerto Rico. It's nice to see you. Jason is here from Vancouver. And Carl, hey, bud. Ronald from Ohio. Ragnus from Estonia. Very cool. Michael Bay is here. How you doing, buddy? Let's see here. Yes, from Birmingham. Very cool. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, so what we're going to be doing today, and I've actually got next week planned out too. I think next week's going to be a really good one for you as well. Um, but this week what we're going to be talking about is some things that as teachers, not that we do them incorrectly because that's not true at all, but just learning the difference between fundamental practice and creative playing, improv, whatever it might be. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Just say hello to a couple more people here. Eric Sparks is here. Very nice. Um, Akiva is here from Long Island. Very cool. Stevie is here from Massachusetts. Very cool. Arno is here. Uh, I'm having a good day, Arno. I hope you are too. Uh, Johnny is here. Very cool. Alpha is here. Ryan is here. Thank you, everybody. Marco's here. Thank you, everybody. So awesome. We're, we already have a lot of people here. So let's go ahead and start it. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I wanted to give you something to think about. Now, in my years of teaching, what I'm teaching people about fundamental practice, right? It might be something where we're going. You know, something like that. And we're trying to develop our finger dexterity and we're trying to develop synchronization and, you know, understanding that when we're picking, we're dealing with, you know, dynamics and trying to make sure that the pinky isn't quieter than the first finger or whatever it might be. And everything sounds smooth and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So then what we do is we start moving into, uh, playing scales, right? So maybe one of the first scales that you learn how to play might be the pentatonic scale, which again, I say that because it is one of the first skills we learn how to play, but it's also one of the most important skills we learn how to play, certainly from a rock and blues perspective. So if I take that, that scale, right, I take this uh, A minor pentatonic, right? Now, as, as teachers, we teach people to practice that up and down, right? You're learning how to alternate pick or however it is you're approaching this. And sometimes we even make those into exercises where you're going to go. And then we incorporate a metronome in there. And this is all fundamental practice. I actually have a, a guitar course that was just released not very long ago, long ago about developing a practice routine. And this is something that we talk about. So fundamental practice is an essential part of your daily or weekly practice routine, whatever, trying to develop your ability, not just how fast you can play, but how strong you are in, you know, certain aspects of your picking and, and different kinds of things like that to develop your confidence and your ability of being able to play very smooth and comfortable and clean, right? That's, that's kind of the whole point. What I found though, over a period of time of teaching that was one thing that I wasn't doing as well as a teacher when I was younger was trying to make the transition of understanding fundamental practice to creative practice, right? Which is why a lot of times when people play, they say, well, how come my solos always sound like I'm just playing scales? Well, part of the reason is because we, we teach you that as teachers and we're not always aware that maybe we, we haven't explained to you the reality of what goes into an improvisation or a creative, you know, situation you might find yourself, maybe you're writing something or whatever it might be. So today what I thought I would talk about a little bit, uh, hello, Chris, just saying hi to a couple people here. Um, Rito is here. Very nice. Brian is here. Peter is here. Mike Warren is here. Josh is here. Hey, everybody. Marco is here. Lawrence is here. Thank you, everybody. It's awesome that you, you're spending time with me. I sure to appreciate that. So 
Here's what I want you to understand is I remember when I was younger and I was learning how to play, and maybe you can relate to this, okay? I was learning how to play the first position of A minor pentatonic. We'll start there, and I just I just showed you that, right? So I'm learning how to play one, four, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four, one, four. And before I go on, I, I wanna preface this. I really do believe that if you can, to learn to use all four of your fingers is very, very, very important. Like just learning how to play with three fingers. Listen, you can learn how to play amazing with however many fingers, that's, that's you. I'm just saying, if you've got four functional fingers, it is beneficial at certain times to be able to use any of those four fingers in various combinations of those, right? So just keep that in mind as we talk about this because you might do did things differently than what I'm doing them right now and it's okay. I just wanna say that I think that's very important, okay? So back to this. So as I'm learning how to play this first position, I'm learning how to play it as one, four, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four, one, four. So I'm getting comfortable with using my pinky and all that sort of thing. And then you move into the second position and I always hated the second position because if I'm playing it in that fundamental aspect, with the proper fingers, like I always used to explain to people, and I still do, that you know when you're playing rudimentary stuff, you've got four fingers that can cover four frets. Now, needless to say, you can cover more, right? But you usually don't do something where maybe your first finger's on the fifth fret and then your pinky's on the sixth fret. Like, that doesn't make a lot of logical sense. If you're playing a sequence of something, let's see, uh, you know, whatever it might be, you're thinking about the fingers relating to the fret and then that finger now has a job to do depending on which fret you're playing, right? That sort of thing. You know, as opposed to you know, trying to do something like that, you're assigning fingers to frets. So when I got to the second position of A minor pentatonic, it looks like this. It goes 8-10, 7-10, 7-10, 7-9, 8-10, 7-9, 8-10, 8, 10. So in that line of thinking, I'm playing from the seventh fret to the 10th fret. So the rudimentary, fundamental, fundamental, excuse me, way of fingering this would make sense to be 8, 10, 7, 10, 7, 10. So what I'm doing is playing my middle to my pinky, my first to my pinky, my first to my pinky, my first to my third, and then my middle to pinky, middle pinky, okay? So if that makes sense, now if we go to the real world, I'm gonna try and get caught up with some of these. There's just a million comments here saying hello and I'm telling y'all, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, but I wanna try and scroll down if I can here. There we go. Awesome. So here's the deal. When learning how to play that, in the real world, I can't think of a time where I would ever wanna be on my middle and my pinky at the same time. Unless it was a sequence, you know, maybe where I'm playing uh, three notes on a string, then I would do it all the time. But if I had the option of playing first and third versus second and fourth, I would always opt for the first and third. Now that doesn't mean that there might be a, a time in your playing where you wind up on the second and fourth and you gotta make it work, it happens. But let's be real, that's what I want to talk to you about today, is if I was playing this second position and I was doing it not from a fundamental perspective of you know, finger development, strength, you know, whatever that is. If I was playing this second position in a real world position or a real world mindset, I should say, I would play it as first finger, third finger, let me switch cameras here. So I'm playing eighth to 10th fret, but instead of playing two to four, I would play one to three. But then that would screw up the next string because then the next string, I've got to move back and play one to four, okay? Well, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll play that as one to three. And it's not because I'm not capable with my pinky, it's because it makes more sense in my head, in what I'm gonna show you next, to play it as the same fingers. Now that means when I get to the third string, I'm either gonna play one to three, or I'm gonna play one to two. Which almost makes more sense with the way I'm playing this right now. You see that? And then... So the way I play that in the real world, and again, I say real world meaning if you were in the creative mindset, if, if you think of it that way. I would be playing one, three, 
on 8 and 10, 1, 3 on 7 and 10, 1, 3 on 7 and 10, 1, 2 on 7 and 9, and then 1, 3 on 7 and 10 and 7 and 10 again. So my first finger is being used the entire time. Now, that doesn't mean I'm always going to play it that way because here's the, here's the thing I wanted to get across today is whenever you're building something, you always have to remember that you are going to be affected by where you're coming from and where you're going to. Let's say you're trying to improvise. You're trying to make something up and you're working on, again, diatonic, pentatonic, whatever. But you have to understand that where you're coming from is going to affect the fingers that you wind up on or where you're going to or what you're trying to set up. Right? So let me show you something, for instance. Let's say I was in that A minor pentatonic position, and now you'll see I'm using 1-3-1-3. One, three, one, three. Well, why would I do that if I've got my pinky available? Well, it depends. If I was doing something maybe where I want to go, and I want to reach out to that 10th fret with my pinky to try and make some sort of lick or whatever it might be that I'm doing, I'm pre-setting myself up by playing this because if I did this, I don't have that available. Now I could shift up, but that doesn't, it, it's not near as efficient. It's not going to be as quick to grab. So if I knew I was going to that, that would be a reason why I would set myself up with the wrong fingers, if you will, thinking about it from the fundamentals mindset, right? The rudimentary mindset. So let's say we're playing and we're going to shift into another position. So I'll show you a couple of different examples of this. So let's say I was in A minor pentatonic again, and I'm going to shift into the second position. So I know one of the places I'm going to go here is up in this spot right up here. Especially if I'm playing blues, right? All that. Which all requires me to be in this first and third finger mentality because I've got my pinky here for my blues note. I got my major third, and again, I'm not trying to over, you know, talk over your head or anything, so if you don't know what those things are, don't stress about it, okay? But just think about that. So, as I'm playing, I want to get set up in that position, so I don't want to slide in with my pinky because I'm going to have to reposition myself anyway. So, because of where I'm coming from, I'm going to go into this with my third finger. Which sets me up, you see? So I want to be aware of that. Just like if I was playing in this first position and I slid into the second position on the fifth or fourth strings. I would wind up on my third finger because that's where I would normally be here. Right? I'd be on my third finger right there. So if I slid up, I'd slide up on my third finger and wind up on the, again, wrong finger if you were thinking of it fundamentally. Now, if I was playing something, let's say I wanted to continue on to the third position, so I'm moving like this. Now, if you know your third position, it's, on, I'm on the 10th fret here, I'm playing 10, 12, 10, 12, 10, 12, 9, 12, 10, 13, 10, 12. Now, again, if you don't know that, that isn't what this lessons about. So I don't want you to stress out and go, I don't know that position. You can, you can learn it. You can watch this video as many times as you want if you want to go back and learn that. But my point is, if I'm shifting from my first to my second to my third position, and the second position is that 710 in the center there, I'm not going to shift out of that and try and shift into my pinky just because fundamentally I'm supposed to be on that finger. You see, I would be very comfortable just using my... First and third, and then setting myself up from there, okay? So there's lots of different ways. Here's another example I want to show you, okay? Let's say I was playing in the third position on the top here, which is going to be um, 10, 13, 10, 12, which would be the, the proper fingers for that, right? And let's say I, I was going to slide into the fourth position. I'm going to move to the third string here. Right there. I'm going to slide in with my third finger. Okay. Now, if I did that, if I slid in on my third finger, it enables me to do something like this. Let's say I wanted to cut across. I wanted to play 14, 13, 12. 
Okay, well that's the perfect fingers for that. And then wherever I want to go from there. You see? But let's say in coming off of that, for whatever reason, I was on these fingers. I went to my third finger here on that 13. Hopefully this is kind of making sense to you. And, and then I wound up on my middle finger here. So I slid with my middle finger, okay? Well, now I don't have enough fingers to play 14, 13, 12. I'm in the wrong position. Now, in saying wrong, that's not really a proper way of saying that because I could do something else. But what I can't do is 14, 13, 12 without some major reconstruction of what I'm doing right now with my fingers. So if I came across this and slid into that, I'd wind up going at it I always call these escape routes, if you've ever heard me talk about those, is when you wind up on a particular finger in a particular position, it sets you up for the next thing that you're going to be doing, or at least it prohibits other things that you might have done depending on what fingers you're on, you see? Because there's just certain things that you can do very comfortably in certain positions versus other positions um, depending on what fingers you're on, you see? So the point of this, the bottom line of today is, for you to work on this week, is if you're working on improvisation and you're learning how to meander and all these things I teach you, what I need you to understand is that your fingers will not always be fundamentally correct with the rudimentary way that you practice scales. And that's not a bad thing. It's it's for you to get used to understanding what fingers you wind up with when you're shifting. Because that's half the battle. Because as you get into a certain position, if you're in a certain fingering, like again, if I was here and I was using these fingers, I wouldn't go into that lick. I wouldn't do that because I'm not on that finger. But what I might do is move into another idea that takes me from this into whatever it is I'm gonna do from there. So think about that. And one way to approach this when you're practicing these things is always remember that, in my opinion anyway, your fretboard is really cut into three different ways. You've got a horizontal movement, excuse me, vertical movement, excuse me. You've got a horizontal movement. And then you've got arpeggios, which we'll call cutting or slicing through the strings. So when you're playing something and you come across an idea and you wanna go. Right? So you're not just playing straight up and down. I'm in E minor now, but, um, and you're not just playing uh, horizontally. Right, which is great. I love thinking about my fretboard in those three ways because I play very differently when I play vertically versus horizontally. And then again, the, the slicing idea of being able to play um, arpeggio ideas. But I understand when I'm playing like an arpeggio like that, like right now I'm playing a G major seven arpeggio. So I'm going and again, don't, don't, don't worry about it. But, um, cause again, you can always go back and watch what I'm doing if you want to, want to steal any of this stuff. But see, I wind up on my pinky. So then my question is, well, what do I do? Well, I could go backwards into something else, right? If I went or wherever, or I could go into something else, or maybe just a half step up. But the point is, is that I'm on the pinky at that point and I need to make a choice, okay? Now, I don't have to continue on with the first string. I could have gone back down. into something else, but this is something I need to get comfortable with, you see? So I'm not as worried about that I'm the, the fact that I'm using the proper fingering that I was doing when I was practicing the scale to develop my speed and all those sorts of things. Because remember, when I go back into my vertical playing, that's when I'm gonna start thinking about, well, how do we wanna approach this? Right? If I wanted that, if I wanted that lick or I wanted that idea, I'm going to use that proper fingering that I've practiced fundamentally over and over and over. That's really what licks are, right? It's the meandering in between that gets me from there. Like if I play that and I get to the top, I got to figure out where to go after that. 
and the finger that I'm on is going to kind of dictate to which direction I'm going to go. And I, again, I know that might be a little bit complicating, but if that makes sense, or at least to some degree, that's what I want you to start thinking about is that movement idea and how it's going to be different than when you're fundamentally practicing. Okay? So if you keep practicing thinking about that idea, um, I'd like sweeping, Marcy says. Uh, late as always, Jason says. I'm glad you're here, Jason. So anyway, if that makes sense, let's see here. Uh, Marcy says, when soloing, sometimes I'm not sure what keys to go to. Well, that's a, that's a, Marcy, that's a great thing to mention, but we're not going to go through that today, but, because that's, that's a little bit different conversation, but I'm glad at least you're thinking about those sorts of things. So again, just to summarize and get out of here, because I know you got to get back to your life, but um, when you're practicing your improv or your creative mindset, always remember as you're shifting in and out, don't feel bad because you wind up on a finger that is not in the right place in what you practice in a fundamental sense. And I always go back, if you know what I'm talking about, if you go to that second position of A minor pentatonic or minor pentatonic, it used to drive me insane that I would wind up on my middle and my pinky because I just would never use. There'd be no time that I would ever elect to use those fingers. If I mandatorily got into a situation where I had to do that, of course that's fine. But I would always elect to use my first and third if I was playing a whole step uh, movement, you know, five to seven or eight to 10 or whatever it might be. I would definitely use that. So that just always just drove me crazy because again, it's not that I don't want to develop my middle and my pinky and the strength between those two. Of course I do. But if I was, if you and I were playing in a band together and we're on stage and I'm going to play, I'm not going to force myself to use that fingering because, well, that's the way I was practicing it when I was practicing. You know what I mean? I want to do what feels best to me. So the execution of whatever it is I'm trying to do is as best as I can make it for that situation for both me and for anybody who's listening. All right. So take care. Stay positive. Next week, I got another really great one for you. So be watching for that. You know, I don't usually I go to I'm, I'm on central time. So usually it's around 11, 12 o'clock, something like that, that I'll, I'll go live. But I got a really good one for you to think about uh, next week well, as well. And it's still going to be based off single notes and soloing and that sort of thing. And then after that, I'll go back to doing some chordal stuff and, and things like that. So I keep kind of getting everybody. All right. So take care. Stay positive. Remember, if you get a chance, head over to guitarzoom.com, check out my guitar courses, check out the membership, all that sort of thing. I very much appreciate uh, you, you know, hanging out with me and, and supporting what I do and, you know, like, share, all that sort of thing if you can. So take care, stay positive. If you want to play guitar solos with complete confidence that sound more fluid and musical than ever before, or play solos over different styles of music in a live band where you're effortlessly trading licks with fellow musicians, and ultimately have more fun playing guitar, then you're gonna to wanna to pay close attention and watch this video the whole way through because you're about to discover a simple way to combine fretboard knowledge, scales, modes, chords, triads, licks, melody, technique, speed, and accuracy into an awesome solo that tells a story instead of sounding like random notes or a scale. Without spending months trying to figure out how to pull all the pieces of the puzzle together yourself, just to end up confused or picking up a bunch of bad habits that could prevent you from ever playing guitar solos like you want to. My name is Steve Stein and I'm a guitar player just like you. Even though I have a degree in music education and have toured across the world playing guitar, I've always thought the way soloing is taught in pieces without a clear way to put them all together to play a great solo was overwhelming. Maybe I'm old school or something, but I never really got how some people could learn soloing by mastering hundreds of scales, patterns, licks, and spending hours on fretting and picking exercises. And I've tried all kinds of stuff like I'm sure you have, and it sure has been frustrating. Like going through dozens of tab books, going through my favorite solos note by note, spending hours digging through every scale book I could find, and practicing every position up and down the fretboard. Or playing along to solos by my favorite guitar players that sound good, but not being able to create my own from scratch. After spending all this time and money, soloing just never really clicked. I thought, there surely must be something I'm missing that will give me an aha moment 
where I can play fluid and melodic solos in my own signature style. That's when I decided to throw everything I'd learned out the window and start from scratch. After a few weeks, it dawned on me that I'd been thinking about soloing the wrong way. You see, I always thought solos were made of pieces of scales, licks, patterns, and whatever cool tricks I could do, but I discovered a shocking fact. Guitar solos simply tell a story. A story-based solo goes through several sections, an introduction, rising action, and a climax. It might restate or build on a theme or melody from the song. It sounds awesome because it serves the song and audience instead of the guitar player. When I learned how to tell a story, my guitar solos improved tremendously. I never had problems trying to figure out how to start or end my solos and never ran out of ideas because I was laser focused on telling a story within the song. I started sharing this with some of my private students and they started getting similar results. I want to share it with you too. And I found the best way to break down old patterns, keeping you from playing solos at a high level and ensure that you're improving your solos day after day, week after week, is my new six week soloing challenge. Now here's some of what you're going to discover. In week one, we're going to talk about how to set up and tune your guitar to get the best tone with the least amount of effort. The critical difference between planned playing and improvisation. Why good technique can kill your ability to make music and how to fix it. A simple way to create your own signature style that doesn't take hours of practice. In week two, we're going to learn how to develop razor sharp timing in 10 minutes using a metronome how to dial in your signature sound using your existing gear. A simple three-step soloing formula that trains your brain to hit the right notes even if you don't know scales. In week three, we're going to learn a quick and easy way to visualize notes on the fretboard, which means you'll always know where to place your fingers when you're soloing. How to play the most important scales for soloing across the fretboard. In week four, we're going to learn how to use phrasing and dynamics to play authentic solos that never sound like a boring scale. One simple three note per string pattern to play lightning fast licks even if you struggle with all alternate picking, how to create a groove that tells a story in your solos. In week five, we're going to learn how to use escape routes to connect ideas and play musical solos across the fretboard without getting stuck. Five picking patterns every lead guitar player must know. And in week six, we're going to learn how to build an impressive guitar solo from the ground up the right way so you have a proven plan to begin and end your solos with a bang. This six week soloing challenge isn't just six weeks of videos. It's going to be six weeks of videos interacting with me the Guitar Zoom staff, and fellow challenge members. I'll be going live once per week for six weeks with you, which I've never done before. So I can help you wire in all the things you'll learn during the challenge and you'll have an opportunity to ask me questions. You don't have to worry if you can't make it because I'll post the recordings in the private Facebook group and your members area. What makes this different from my other courses is there'll be accountability as well. You'll have activities to keep you engaged throughout the challenge so you stay motivated and see real, noticeable improvements in how you think about and play solos. Plus, you'll be going through the entire process with a group of like-minded guitar players who are focused on playing better solos. And the encouragement you find and connections you make on this journey will be so powerful. Similar good courses cost hundreds of dollars or even a thousand dollars at Berklee College of Music Online. Or you can do like I did and spend thousands of dollars in college learning what I'm gonna show you. With all that said, this could easily sell for a thousand dollars. After all, similar courses sell for $1,497. Of course, it won't cost you a thousand dollars, not $500, not even a hundred dollars. You get to enroll in the six week solo challenge for just three payments of $26.80. Or you can save 17% if you want to make one payment of $67. Another one of the most important things you can develop as a guitar player is your technique. That's why I've included my six and a half hour Essential Techniques course as a special bonus. You'll learn the secrets of building your picking speed and accuracy, strumming, bends, harmonics, and whammy bar tricks to spice up your guitar solos and dozens of licks that will sound awesome in your solos. If you were to buy this on the website a few months back, it would have cost you $99, but you get it free when you order today. And if you order right now, you'll also get my Music Theory Made Easy 2.0 course free. It originally sold for $99 and covers all the music theory shortcuts you need to play freely across the entire fretboard and really get creative when it comes time to solo. With this course, you're going to overcome problems like worrying about what scale will sound good for leads and alternative scales you can use to improvise better solos than you ever thought possible. You won't have to worry about feeling lost or confused because your fingers will be trained to instantly find the right notes without any hesitation. So to recap, you get to start my new six week soloing challenge which starts on May 2nd and all the great bonuses I just mentioned for three payments of $26.80 
or one payment of $67. And you're protected by our 30-day guarantee. Truly, put it to the test for a full 30 days and see if it's right for you. And if you don't think it's a good fit, no big deal. Just contact our friendly support team and they'll issue you a full refund or exchange. No questions asked, no receipt required. However, I can only offer this price and bonuses for a short time. After that, the price increases to $199 and the bonuses won't be included. So click the button below and get started today. As soon as you place your order, you'll get a receipt in your email with instructions on how to access the course. You'll also get an email with your link to join the private Facebook group for challenge members and immediate access to the Essential Techniques and Music Theory Made Easy 2.0 bonus courses. If you want a simple way to put all the pieces together to play solos that tell a story across the fretboard, then you're absolutely going to love Six Week Soloing Challenge. And it's simple to get started. You log into the course and watch your first short video, and as you build your skills, you move to the next video. You complete the weekly accountability activities and attend the weekly live sessions, always at your own pace. You can watch and repeat lessons as many times as you need, and your soloing ability will skyrocket. Remember, this could easily sell for $1,000, but you can have it today for only three payments of $26.80 or one payment of $67. And when you order, you'll also get an email with the link to the private Facebook group and immediate access to the Essential Techniques and Music Theory Made Easy 2.0 courses. You'll learn all the techniques you need to play killer solos and all the scales you need to improvise solos over any song. The six live sessions and bonuses alone have a $918 value, and you get our 30-day guarantee. But remember, I can only offer this price and bonuses for a short time. After that, the price increases to $199 and the bonuses won't be included. So click the button below and get started today.